Good afternoon and welcome to a quick bulletin here on the Angry Astronaut. Just quickly covering what happened with the H3 rocket. I'm not going to talk a great deal about it because I've already gone into a great deal of depth about how important I feel that JAXA is going to be to Artemis in the future. If you're interested in any of that, I have that particular video linked at the end of this one. But I have to admit, I'm a little annoyed about how this failure is being received in the media right now. Now, granted, it was a bit of a letdown last night, definitely, to go from a spectacular takeoff, a moment like this. It's SRB3 takeoff, lift off. boosters, ignition, and lift off. To a moment more like this. Oh, yeah. Storage area 9. Uh, self-destructed last week and destroyed the ship's entire supply of toilet paper. And this is not to suggest that an extremely valuable mapping satellite, multi-million dollar piece of equipment, is about as valuable as toilet paper. Get real, toilet paper is way more valuable, come on. But anyway, it's also just the matter of what, how this was perceived and what the reaction was. And I was very disappointed about all of that because really everybody is looking at this as some sort of huge failure, massive setback for Japan, for their space program, etc. It's only that bad if we make it that bad, if the reaction is that bad, because this was nowhere near near as serious a problem as the failure of Virgin Orbit was at Spaceport Cornwall. And the reason for that is Mitsubishi Heavy Industries that manufactures the rocket is not going to be in any kind of serious trouble as a result of this failure. Their stock barely ticked over <laughs> in the negative direction today as a result of the failure. It wasn't something that even really registered because making rockets is such a small part of of what Mitsubishi Heavy Industries does, as opposed to Virgin Orbit. That was a failure they really couldn't afford to have, given their limited cash flow availability and the fact that they're trying to convince everybody that they can launch from anywhere, anytime, and their first attempt to launch from another country ended in failure. So, this was the first brand new rocket that Japan was attempting to launch in the last 20 years. Did we really expect it to go perfectly the first time? I was really hoping that it would go well. We have this perception of the Japanese, you know, given the quality of their cars, their computers, everything else they manufacture, that they are going to be perfect right off the bat every time. And that's just not the case. We really, just this unrealistic expectation to have that the odds were incredibly good that this was going to be a successful flight on the first attempt. Indeed, I think it actually went pretty well because those brand new engines, the LE9 engines on the uh, the H3, they performed very well. They seem to have performed nominally all the way to the point to where the second stage was supposed to separate and ignite, and that's where things broke down. And the second stage was a less experimental part of this rocket than the first stage in those LE9 rockets, which contain a fuel cycle unlike anything else that's ever been used on the first stage of a rocket before. Once again, if you want more information about that, my video is linked at the end of this one. So the fact that all of that went really well indicate that indicates to me anyway that this could be a problem that's fairly easy to fix. Now, don't get me wrong. This was a setback. There's no question about it. But now it's up to Japan to determine how they want to react to this setback. Are they going to have to do an in-depth investigation of the entire program to just you know, see what could have caused it and where things are seriously broken right now. I don't think things are really that broken over at JAXA or at Mitsubishi, in my opinion. I think this is just something you can expect with a brand new rocket utilizing innovative designs. And there's something else to consider as well. This rocket is designed to take substantial payloads to orbit for less than $40 million, a substantial discount over Falcon. 9. And the way they're doing that is using a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components. 
some of which can you know be subject to failure they can be vulnerable so you could expect this sort of thing to happen as well as japan tries to not only compete with spacex but also to undercut them that is an aggressive plan indeed especially with an expendable rocket but it's something that they theoretically are going to be able to accomplish if this rocket becomes a reliable vehicle in the future. And I have every confidence that it's going to. But finally, what about Artemis? How is this going to affect JAX's contribution to Artemis? Well, when it comes right down to it, as long as H3 does perform in the future, it shouldn't affect it at all. Because as far as lunar resupply, as far as lunar gateway resupply, and as far as delivering a lunar rover in 2029, Japan has a lot of time to do all of these things. It's going to be a long time before NASA really needs any of these services from JAXA. And as I've complained about a number of times in the past, NASA hasn't even really set down any particular plans on how to collaborate with JAXA. Now, this, of course, was a setback, this failure with the rocket, because NASA needs to know that they're going to have a reliable partner with a reliable rocket. But I have every confidence that that's what's going to happen. Once again, if you want a lot more details on how Japan is going to contribute to Artemis, how big of a contribution they can make, if you haven't checked out that video, please do so, linked at the end of this one. So until Japan has a successful launch of their H3 in the future, until they pick themselves up and dust themselves off, as everybody, including SpaceX, has had to do in the past, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.